using those models and finally some tools that are fairly easy to understand some of which you might want to take away and use with your own patients and clients. Uh, resilience, as Mike talked about, is the ability to bounce back from some kind of stress on the system. In a physical object like a rubber ball, the ball is compressed when you drop it on the floor and then it expands again to its previous shape and bounces it back again. Things like springs and ball bearings are even more resilient. Uh, in an ecosystem, it's the measure of a system's ability to withstand disturbance and return to its normal state. Disturbance that maybe we create, disturbance due to other natural disorders. Uh, in a person, it's the ability to recover quickly from illness, change, misfortune, or other sorts of setbacks. A resilient person has a kind of buoyancy. Uh, this is a list of the models I use, and I'll be going in, into them each briefly in the next few minutes. The most important is, and the one that was the key for me, especially in working with, I was at the time working with very traumatized heroin addicts on methadone and recovery, um, is the trauma reenactment triangle as described by a woman named Dusty Miller. She posits that people who primarily addicts, are the, which are the people that she works with, but I found it to be true for people with depression, anxiety, lots of mental illnesses. They've been in some sort of neglected situation where they were either um, injured directly or indirectly felt an injury because of a lack. So they were sort of the victim. Um, in their original situation, there was some kind of non-protecting bystander who knew what was going on but didn't do anything to prevent it, was ineffective at presenting it, or didn't even really know what was going on but should have. So in this picture, there's a direct action from the abuser going to the victim, and the non-protecting bystander's action just sort of goes nowhere. Uh, this is not working. When you work with clients to reconfigure the trauma reenactment triangle, you help them develop a true protector in persons, places, and things uh, in their lives, and replace the non-protecting bystander with that true protector. And the true protector goes in between the, not only the physical abuser, but in any internalized abuser that keeps the trauma going. And the victim becomes the child free to become who that child was never free to be and gets reintegrated with the self. Another similar model is called spell psychology. It was developed by my mentor, James Grant. He uses myths, folk tales, and other types of stories to, to conceive of um, a sort of magical spell that people are cast under by their environment in their early years, usually. And it consists of what we would normally call defense mechanisms and dysfunctional patterns of thought, feeling, and behavior. And they rule the show. They're created by the inner child who is scared, who is trying to find some way out of an impossible circumstance. And like a kid in a, a horror movie, builds a boogeyman. But then the boogeyman takes over and keeps the true self from developing. When you work with clients, when I work with clients to help them recognize their spell and then interrupt it, eventually the spell is held back by the true self. The true self gets stronger. The true self gets reunited by the inner child, and, and both the inner child and the true self joined together get to become self-actualized. I also use solution-focused therapy, which is an imagination-based but also cognitive behavioral type of therapy. Um, it uses very concrete ways to help people see their lives as they would be if their current problems, if the things that brought them into therapy were no longer problems. And it begins with what they call the miracle question, which is a little too long to read here, but the gist of it is that in the middle of the first or second session, after people have told me all the things that have been bothering them, I will ask them to imagine that when they leave the room and go through the rest of the day, and then finally go to sleep at night. While they're sleeping, a miracle occurs. And it's a very specific miracle. And in that miracle, all their problems and concerns are solved like that. However, because this has happened while they've been sleeping, they don't know that it's happened. And so the first part of the question that I guide them through, and it becomes a framework for the way to do therapy I, with them, is what do you notice when you wake up that's different, that lets you know something that was a problem before is no longer a problem, and finally leads you to that Wizard of Oz moment. You know, I, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Um, a really pivotal piece of my own development as a therapist and also as a person recovering from my own trauma has been learning focusing. 
which is a body-oriented talk therapy developed by Eugene Genlin in the early 70s, working with Carl Rogers, originally to try to give people who were unsuccessful in getting better in the course of doing therapy the means to do so. He noticed that certain people, almost no matter what the therapist's background was, almost no matter what their socioeconomic economic status was or the problems they brought to therapy got better and others with the same set of problems didn't. And a key thing was that they would pause, check themselves out, go into themselves and bring back more of the problem than they were aware of consciously. And so by learning focusing, people essentially at first could be taught to become clients and then they could use that anywhere in their lives. Uh, I, I currently practice focusing with a focusing partner. We've been working for about a year and a half. And I think in the course of focusing, I personally have gotten to places I was unable to get in many years of therapy. Uh, focusing is, uh, Jenlin wrote a short layperson book called Focusing. There's also a lot of information, information on the focusing.org site. There's some very instructive short videos of him doing focusing and talking about it at the same time on YouTube. I highly recommend it. Finally, is the largest framework of the way in which I work with clients. Uh, I use the hero's journey as defined by Joseph Campbell in his book, The Hero with the Thousand Faces. Um, Campbell broke down into about 18 segments, most of the myths and folk tales that involved heroes that he knew of at that time, and they are replicated also today in um, action movies, often in comedies, and in the lives of our clients and patients. Uh, the gist of it is that a hero ventures forth from the world of the common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered, and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. And what working with clients on the hero's journey does for them, I find, is it redeems parts of their lives that they feel shame or embarrassment about um, because those parts in the hero's stories turn out to be necessary for the heroes to learn things they could never otherwise have learned. And then it's like a you are here map for where they're going to go if they keep going, if they do get, pick themselves up and move forward. Uh, there are three basic stages. This comes from a summary on Wikipedia, which I highly recommend. Maybe everything on Wikipedia is not so good, but this is a very clear summary of his book. Um, the first phase is the departure phase. The next phase is the initiation phase, where the person is in this strange world, whether it's depression or addiction or a war, uh, and in it they uncover what, they what they're meant to do. And the final phase, which is as difficult as the initiation phase and the departure phase, is the return back to the world with something that's of value both to themselves and others. Okay, I'm talking today about cultivating resilience and post-traumatic growth with art and creativity. Um, first, I want to introduce a little bit about myself and explain the various perspectives I have on the power of art making. I'm an art therapist, and I think what propelled me so passionately into the field of art therapy was my experiences in art school. It was then that I learned that my mother was terminally ill, and I'm not sure how well I would have survived without being immersed in opportunities to express myself and examine, make my feelings concrete and explore them and understand them better. Um, I'm also an artist and a musician. And I'm a survivor of my fiance's suicide six years ago, which he committed in front of me. And multiple layers of trauma throughout my life. And I also battle depression and anxiety. Um, Eleanor Ullman is a founder of the field of art therapy. And she said, art is the meeting ground of the world inside and the world outside, which I felt was a, a nice uh, explanation of the role that art has played in my life. It, it has served kind of as a window um, into my internal world, kind of making my unconscious conscious. Um, <clears throat> art therapy uses the creative process, which I believe exists within everyone, to promote growth, self-expression, conflict resolution, recovery and healing, transformation, and self-empowerment. While this isn't a complete list, these are all um, similar objectives for traditional talk psychotherapy. And in fact, I am trained as a marriage and family therapist as well. And I consider art therapy my specialty modality in which I use to engage with patients. <clears throat> um, 
Um, art therapy is based on the belief that art making is healing and it's life enhancing. It's a potent form of communication and it can provide insight and transformation. Um, the structure of my presentation today uh, is my introduction that I just did. Um, next I'll define, compare, and contrast resilience and post-traumatic growth. And in part two, I'll give specific creative interventions or techniques to encourage and support each. And in part three, I will share examples of each as manifested in the creativity of myself and others. Oh, and a, a few more notes before I get started. Obviously, my presentation is from an art therapy perspective, and I also got a large part of the information and the principles from a book by another art therapist named Kathy Malchiotti um, entitled Creative Interventions with Traumatized Children. And so because the book is focused on children, um, a lot of the terms will be specific to children, uh, the principles and the um, interventions. But I think, I believe that they can be with, if you keep the developmental aspects um, considered, that they can be used for people of all ages. And also, I might note that a lot of my slides have a lot of information on them. So at the end, I'll give my uh, email address. Because of time constraints, I'll have to skip through a lot of it quickly. And um, you can request the, sl the slides from me, a copy of them. OK, both resilience and post-traumatic growth um, are both terms to describe coping after a trauma. Um, but they're two different responses. Resilience is the ability to bounce back to former um, functioning, and post-traumatic growth is improved functioning after the trauma. Um, this is a list of factors found to be associated um, to resilience in children. And as you can see, it's like above average verbal communication skills, positive beliefs about self and future, a strong cultural connection or a cultural identity. So this reads like a, a list of strengths. And um, also associated to genetics, positive role modeling from parents or caregivers, um, support systems, and developmental factors. And um, so because this is like a set of strengths and resources, you can develop and um, promote resilience um, preventatively. Um, this is a list of questions that can be helpful to use to identify resilience. And these questions basically um, direct your attention to your strengths and resources and, again, your basic coping skills. Um, Post-traumatic growth uh, is a result of lessons learned from a trauma because in some people, the experiences of trauma can produce some psychological and interpersonal gains, which is manifested in some behaviors that were not present before the trauma, such as a greater appreciation of life, an increased sense of personal strength, a realization of new possibilities, and improved relationships. And on a personal note, these are all um, things that I've experienced in my own post-traumatic growth. Um, here are, is a list of experiences that are related to post-traumatic growth in children. And it's similar to the list for adults. Um, it's a, um, the developmental factors are just considered and they compare it to similar age peers. Um, again, as with resilience, it can be helpful to identify post-traumatic growth with a set of questions. And these questions basically focus on comparing before and after the trauma and exploring the meaning and what you learned from the experience. And I thought this was an interesting point that Malchiotti made in her book. She said that it's possible for people to display resilience or a high level of coping after a trauma and not exhibit post-traumatic growth. And conversely, it's possible for people to experience post-traumatic growth yet not be resilient in the true sense of the word. And I believe, personally, I fit into the second category, although I do believe my post-traumatic growth has increased my resilience. So. Now I'm going to talk about some ways that I help to build resilience. And that many of them are based on ways I myself, like Jennifer, have become more resilient as a result of my own post-traumatic growth. Um, one of the keys is being able to, uh, learning how to see problems as opportunities for growth. Uh, an acronym I sometimes use with clients if they've got the right kind of sense of humor is AFGO, another effing growth opportunity. It's something that, 
that you get, it's there it is, you don't really want it, but if you go through it, you'll learn from it, and they laugh just like you're laughing, and then they go ahead and tackle the thing instead of avoiding it or feeling like a victim. Um, and each time they tackle something new that they were been unable to tackle before, even if they're kind of knocked down and knocked about in the process, they often feel stronger. And that's the typical structure of the hero's journey. Um, resilience, I think of as a dynamic quality. You can build it. Uh, you can also temporarily at least diminish it, harm it if people don't have enough support. So a lot of what I work with is not only immediately developing resilience, but learning how to develop a so support system internally and externally. That, um, that promotes resilience in the face of future difficulties. Um, a, an example of a person with a great degree of resilience and one who doesn't, who has, has the same dsm 4 disorder would be somebody with an addictive problem who relapsed. A resilient re uh, addict will keep doing all the other things that help make him stay sober and help improve his life. Uh, a a non-resilient addict will relapse and will use the relapse as a way to drop everything and essentially drop back to where they were before, have a long relapse typically, and have to climb back up the hill again, hopefully becoming more resilient in the process. Uh, this is a list uh, which I'll be going into in more detail of some of the internal resources that I try to help people work with to develop resilience. Uh, the first of them might be the most important of which is finding and making safe places. One step is literally removing things that are re-triggering from the environment, uh, things that re-traumatize, and often they're quite prevalent, both in physical objects, things that, rem that they remember, and the things that people that are around them are doing. Um, another useful thing is remembering places that were safe in the past. Often grandmothers come up in people who've been traumatized in their uh, families of origin. Uh, imagining safe places also is helpful. I had a client who grew up with a horrific environment, but the place, she came up with an idealized version of Spain where everything would be okay, and it was a fantasy Spain. It was like, uh, like Van Gogh's Starry Night almost. Um, the next stage is typically to actually find safe places like support groups, 12-step meetings, and finally to create new self safe places that become a part of your life, whether it's mentors or friends or activities that you're interested in, that you become friends with the people involved with, uh, spiritual groups. Physical activity is also very important. It's recently been demonstrated to be as effective as antidepressants for mild to moderate depression, uh, trauma and mental illness damage the body as well as the mind, and healing the body helps to heal the mind. The uh, creative problem-solving attitude, as I said earlier, is, is, is really pivotal to keep reinforcing. So I continually work with people to help them see the AFCOs in their lives. And instead of saying, why did this happen to me, and dwelling on that for a long time, I will touch on that, I'll validate it, and then I'll, I'll help them go to what can I learn from this. Uh, a lot of addicts know that already. They learn that from 12-step programs. They come in saying, Everything happens for a reason, and then we work out what the reason could be, which is really how to turn something that was something bad into a window of an opportunity. Um, sometimes, especially with younger kids, I use something I learned from highlights for children when I was a kid. The riddle is, what's the most powerful nation in the world? And they'll guess the US or the Soviet Union or whatever it is they guess, and instead it's the imagination, and we talk about imagination and ways that you can either envision your future in a different way, like in narrative therapy, or recently I've been having people push themselves 20 or 30 years into the future and look back on the present as a turning point and tell me what they did now that made them have such a great old age. Um, focusing and some techniques I'll talk about later are the main ways that I use to help people reconnect to their core selves, which are, which are usually hidden. Their wounds have become a shield and they initially were protective, but they're sort of like in a, in a titanium shell and I help them peek, peek out of that shell and find what's in there. And in there along with the trauma is usually joy. Um, some of the tools I use for challenging patterns explicitly, the cognitive tools are again the AFCO, the learning to see small windows of opportunities. Uh, there's a wonderful mistaken beliefs questionnaire in a book called The Anxieties and Phobias Handbook, which is useful for more than just anxiety. Uh, I use the miracle question, and at the end of each session, people come up with an experiment, mostly that they derive, which they think will move them more towards the miracle they've imagined. I scale them on a 1 to 10 scale and keep track of that. 
Uh, I, I help them learn to recognize what their spell is and to find ways to see where it wants to take them and to learn how they don't want to go there and what they can do to interrupt it. Um, and I particularly reinforce exceptions to whatever their dysfunctional patterns have been and let them know that each exception is 100 times more important than any subsequent repetition of the pattern because it shows they can keep making exceptions. And all these things instill hope. I encourage creative uh, expression. Lots of people are drawn to me because I'm a writer and a photographer, but I find that many, many people who come to me with addictive disorders or depression or anxiety have some creative bent that they've neglected. Something they did as kids that got lost somewhere as teenagers, and if I notice that or if there's something they always wanted to do but never tried, I'll get them to take a look at it. And it's not always a formally defined so-called creative art. One woman I work with, her house is her work of art. Some people it's gardening. It can be a lot of different things. Um, one explicit use I have done is I've done writing workshops with addicts, which I call memoirs of addiction and recovery. And many of these people had never written before, but the things they produce are astonishingly profound and are things they might not have said in a group therapy setting. Uh, for me, the Flower Mandalas project has been, has been that kind of, kind of a, uh, I'm looking for a flywheel that keeps me going when everything else might be difficult. And in general, these things help people to rechannel energy that really is creative in the first place back to its creative um, means. I also similarly try to encourage a spiritual connection or practice wherever it may be. I don't push it, but if people had some special association to church or prayer, or if they've drifted into meditation or some kind of mindfulness practice, or are amenable to learning some, um, if they know the serenity prayer, if they've touched on Buddhism, I'll try to water the seeds of that. And finally, an internal thing which becomes an external thing is learning that um, when you're in a group situation, say, where people are talking that, about their problems, people often resist that in the beginning. I've, I don't want to listen to somebody else's problems. I've got enough problems of my own. But they find that when they do listen to somebody else's problems and they can help solve those problems, they feel stronger. Uh, sometimes I get that going just by having a small problem that I know they can solve myself, a plumbing problem or something like that if I have a plumber in the room. And, and they'll light up, and then I'll point out how much they lit up helping me even though they have this whole raft of problems. External resources I also work on, and briefly, I help people find close relationships that are usually new relationships or resuscitations of old ones that are healthy. Uh, the therapeutic relationship sometimes is a model for that, but I encourage people to find other guides, other mentors, other companions. Uh, to find some support in the community. Again, it could be a formal therapeutic setting or a church type setting or any kind of group activity that allows people to follow their curiosity and interests and allows them to make new friends. And family is a plus or minus thing. Sometimes the original difficulty that may have caused the trauma in the first place can be reconfigured and people can revisit their family relationships and change them. Sometimes when they try that and they fail and they failed repeatedly, I encourage people to set some distances and boundaries between themselves and their families and start to get the things that they look for that they need from their families from other people who can truly give it to them. And pharmaceutical support I've also found helpful. I work with pharma psychopharmacologists, especially in the early stages, carefully monitored use of antidepressants, sometimes low doses of antipsychotics and benzodiazepines can help break the immediate reaction, fight, flight, freeze response, where they just repeat their trauma and rehearse it again and, and allow them to respond in a more um, varied way and in a healthier way and, and start to develop coping skills. So it slows it down. Okay, in this section of my presentation, I have a lot of artwork on the slides, but I'll talk about that more in detail on my third section. So I'll talk about um, creative interventions that you can use to support resilience and post-traumatic growth. But first I wanted to talk about the relationship between artists, creativity, and madness, since it seems to be a topic of great interest and probably the reason that this conference exists. But um, museums are filled with work that has been inspired by human suffering. And um, for me, Art was a way of making uh, very painful events and situations in my life concrete 
and it allowed me to explore and understand it better so that I could integrate it into my life and ultimately move on. Um, also, the tactile and sensory aspects of creating was grounding and soothing to me. And also, when I actually made something that I liked, um, it was very satisfying too, and it actually gave me a sense of mastery. Um, Plato had a very positive view of creativity. Um, he saw it as a talent or a gift, and he would say that artists were endowed by the gods with a divine madness. In The Courage to Create, Rollo May, May also saw um, creativity uh, in a positive way. He saw it as an indication of the highest degree of emotional health and not a product of sickness. Um, he considered artists as special people because they could live with a high degree of um, emotional distress and transform it into creative works. And a lot of people question whether mental illness can cause someone to be more creative. Oh, these slides are off. Um, as in the case of uh, Van Gogh. Um, but there's actually inconclusive evidence about the connection of mental illness and creativity, even though some scholars have related creativity and genius to madness. And in fact, some of the greatest artists have been mentally ill. But mentally ill artists have reported that their condition is a source of both turmoil and inspiration. Um, and two artists come to mind, or two highly creative people come to mind. Um, she was brought up earlier, Kay Renfield Jameson. She wrote a book about the um, artistic temperament and bipolar disorder called Touch by Fire. And then I also think of John Nash, whose mental illness and his genius was portrayed in the movie A Beautiful Mind. Creativity has helped some people transform conflicts, relieve emotional distress, and explore some personal traumas. But for some artists, creativity is a means of coping rather than the product of, a psych of psychological problems. In traditional talk psychotherapy, it's often about awareness and expression of feelings, but sometimes there's just no words. Um, the emotions that result from trauma are often difficult to articulate because words cannot completely contain or convey their meaning. So there's many levels in which art making is beneficial. Um, especially when you can't find those words to convey those feelings. Um, you don't want to push your feelings inward or suppress them because then they will, can cause further problems for you. And um, art making can also be helpful when the feelings are particularly overwhelming or complex. And I'm process oriented in my practice of art therapy because I believe just engaging in the art materials and the media can be soothing. Um, just as I said before, that art kind of provided a window into my internal world, um, they found that creative expression can provide a window to resilience because elements of rescue, caregiving, or protection have been found to be visual indicators of resilience in children. Um, research has found the following, following factors to promote resilience in children, um, such as providing perceptions of safety and security, um, encouraging healthy behaviors such as exercise, sleep, and proper nutrition. Um, again, just supporting all the strengths and resources. And um, so this is basically a list of supporting the sense of safety and power and minimizing stress. Um, the relationship of parents or caregivers considered to be the strongest factor for resilience in children and a significant factor in how well children do after a trauma. Um, Shirley Riley, who is also an art therapist and my professor in graduate school, um, noted the importance of sensory modalities to enhance the parent-child relationship and to restore a sense of safety and power. Um, the following is a list of art activities that children can do with parents to provide that joint sensory experience. Um, and they basically all support a positive relationship, attachment, and trust, and can strengthen the overall ability to deal with stress. And also, according to Dr. Dan Siegel, these are also experiences that help support the development of healthy neural connections. And this is also a list um, to use with older children, um, such as co-creating with a parent a picture or making a collage of a positive memory. Oh, and I should add here that um, it's easy to incorporate creative interventions into your practice with your clients. Um, it doesn't require a lot of art materials. If you just have a box of crayons, a box of markers, some paper, and some collage pictures, and 
Um, collage pictures, I recommend that you have collage pictures already torn out of magazines. Don't give them complete magazines because then they'll get distracted and read the magazine articles. Um, <laughs> and a glue stick, okay, and, and that should be enough. Um, also, uh, creating a collage about the good things about me. Again, sh um, pointing their attention to their resources, inner and outer resources, and their problem-solving abilities. Um, most of the literature out there right now on how to promote post-traumatic growth is with children who have survived cancer or other serious illnesses, and less is known about those who have experienced trauma from violent, abusive environments or mass disasters. Um, researchers have noted that interventions used to reduce post-traumatic stress disorder may help encourage post-traumatic growth, um, including social support during trauma recovery, developing a cohesive trauma narrative. I think Dr. Oshroff talked a little bit about that. Um, it's important to, um, to develop a trauma narrative because it helps you integrate the experience into your life and to better manage those experiences. Um, and also understanding that one is not to blame for what happened. Um, all the key points in promoting post-traumatic growth um, can be supported or developed with creative interventions, such as identifying inner resources for coping, exploring the meaning of what happened, and reflecting on, on what you've learned. Um, this is a list of creative interventions to promote post-traumatic growth. Um, for example, in the first one, I would take a, a large piece of paper and fold it in half and have one side be the images that you choose that make you feel powerful and the, and the other side would be the, the side that makes you feel powerless. Um, a personal power sh or power shield could be um, the shape of the shield and then you choose images or draw images that, that represent your identity and your strength and, and so forth. And then a butterfly life cycle is a helpful intervention to use with younger children who have suffered a traumatic loss. It uses the metaphor of a butterfly life cycle to explain the cycles of life and to, um, to show that there can be change after a crisis. Um, the basic needs for anyone after a traumatic event is to connect, to feel capable, to count, and to have courage. And all these needs can be addressed with creative interventions. And they're relevant to trauma intervention because they encompass aspects of relationship, um, a positive sense of self, and the ability to overcome adversity. Um, the foundations of both resilience and post-traumatic growth are a feeling of connections to others who care, a recognition of personal capabilities and contributions, and an internal sense of control. And like I said before, resilience may exist um, pre-trauma because you can create it um, preventatively, but both resilience and post-traumatic growth can be developed to better prepare people for future adversity or exposure, and in my opinion, life in general, because you can always use the strengths and, and um, the learning. Um, a couple more uh, specific interventions that I like to use with with my clients for both traumatic, post-traumatic growth and resilience is um, I encourage them to keep a feelings journal um, composed of images, uh, drawings, collage, paintings, um, to explore their feelings. And they can be spontaneous and very simple or they can be more elaborate depending on the client. Um, visual journals also like I said before, it can help you make your feelings concrete in order to let, th let go of them and move on from them. And it also can help you discover unrecognized um, or hidden feelings that you didn't know that you had. And just engaging in the process or media can be relaxing. Also, I, I didn't say before, um, collage is very helpful to use with people who are hung up on their ability to draw or create um, because they're already created images and it helps them get past um, focusing on the product and just engaging in the process. Um, while expressing feelings is very helpful, sometimes it's more important to create images to self-soothe or to create positive sensations. Um, I've talked about most of this already. Um, art making is beneficial because you can communicate trauma, it can be soothing. Um, they actually found that um, children 
who are able to communicate themes of rescue and assist assistance through their artwork often recover from the effect of trauma more quickly than children who can't even imagine getting help from others. Um, in Healing Trauma, Peter Levine talks about working with traumatic memories. Um, and he says you must be able to access the body memories through the felt sense before finding emotional healing. And again, the tactile sensory aspects of making art can help heal the, the cellular memory of the trauma. It can also deepen your understanding. Um, Jane Orlman wrote a book about, um, and, and it's filled with her paintings in which she was trying to make sense of the sexual abuse she suffered as a child. And also art making can be a, a, a creative outlet for children who are afraid of speaking. Many children have been abused or been in violent environments um, are afraid to speak because of the, they've been threatened. And research, research shows that children who draw while talking about a trauma are able to communicate more details in a more organized fashion than children who simply only talk. And historically, humans have incorporated art into um, death rituals and ceremonies. Uh, Mal Chiodi said, it's clear that art somehow helps human beings cope with loss and that it is a universal human experience to express loss through symbols and to use images to relieve emotional distress. Um, some, an example of that is the AIDS quilt. Uh, it's a visual memorial. And in my Survivors After Suicide group, we also created the, a quilt. Um, Kubler-Ross also talks about in her book that individuals tend to spontaneously turn to creative expression when coping with a significant loss. And she acknowledges art therapy as an important way to help explore and express feelings associated with grief. And loss is universal, but loss to suicide, fortunately, is not universal. And grieving suicide involves many conflicting and complex feelings that can be explored with art and creativity. So this last part of my talk is really about tools that I give to clients to help them build resilience. Um, I try to find form a, a pretty strong bond with people and to accompany them on whatever their path is, but I don't want them to remain dependent upon me forever. And I find that when I give them things they can walk away with and do on their own, that helps them make that transition. So I might, for instance, teach them how to do focusing on their own and find somebody to focus with, and that's a little bit too much to go in to now, but I also give them these very short interventions, uh, one of which in, in the beginning is to create a map of their own personal spell, which is usually an interlinking of a set of different problems they have. They start to see them as one big problem with multiple facets and to see a kind of domino effect among those facets. So maybe depression has something to do with addiction, which has something to do with relationship problems, which has something to do with something their parents are doing. And they find when they link these things together that they can then break some of those links and the domino effect goes away. So a spell map for me might look something like this, where I've got depression and anxiety and relationship things over the course of my life, health problems, insomnia, and sometimes there's a cause and effect relationship, sometimes the two things feed each other. And each one of those arrows, if I take a close look at it, if I can break that connection, then the whole thing doesn't have to go on in the way that it typically does, and I have a new pattern. I'm rewriting my life. Another tool that I find useful is sort of how to, to do a preemptive, well, not preemptive strike, a protect, uh, what am I looking for? To look for the early warning signs of, of a relapse, whether it's a relapse into addiction or depression or anxiety or some bad pattern of behavior with somebody else. Um, I have people develop what, what I call, and I took this from a book called A Gentle Path Through the 12 Steps, the Personal Craziness Index. They identify major categories of behavior in their daily life. They identify indicators of either healthy behavior or unhealthy behavior. They identify the top seven things for them, and then they track them. So the categories I typically give people are these, health, housing, transportation, work, hobbies or interests, recreation, family, friends, group activities, spirituality. And then they list three things under each of those. So if I'm being healthy, I'm eating this kind of thing, and I'm sleeping this amount, and I'm doing this amount of exercise, for example. 
it, then this is what my own personal craziness index might look like if I'm looking at the things that are early warning signs I might be headed towards depression. And some of them are very trivial and, and don't seem to mean anything. But for me, I've noticed over the years that these are things that I do maybe a month or two before I'll hit a depression. And if I do the opposite of those things, then the depression doesn't happen. So if I'm not paying bills on time, I'm not taking a walk in the morning and taking a picture, I'm not seeing friends so much, I'm not doing photography in general, which I find to be very restorative, I have the dishes pile up in the sink. Uh, I don't go shopping on a regular basis, and I'm not sleeping very much. Pretty soon I'm going to be depressed. Uh, if, I, if I do the opposite, all those things in green, that episode of depression is averted. And I'm more prepared for the next one. And so I work with people to develop their own indexes like this. I also help them map their lives to the hero's journey. I use that Wikipedia thing that I mentioned before. This particular image comes from the, uh, me one of the memoirs of addiction recovery groups that I did that my co-leader in that group, who was herself recovering from alcoholism, mapped her life and her struggle with alcoholism to the hero's journey. And, um, and it was a, a very complete map. I mean, not everybody finds a link to each one of these different stages, but seeing where you are puts it into a much broader context and seeing your struggle as a heroic struggle rather than as just you're a screw up and you made a lot of mistakes and you wasted your life really changes the way people look at their addictions or their depressions or whatever it is that they're, they're in there before. Um, I also help people create ways to link what their problems are with what their resources are, both internal resources and external resources. So initially I'll have them on a regular piece of paper, draw a circle, and in the middle put their main problems. Uh, I'll draw, have them draw another circle around that and then this is how they use it. Um, in, the inner in the second circle, rather, the outer ring, the sort of donut, they write all their internal resources, things they can do without needing help from anybody else. And, in the, um, and this can be things they already do or things they've thought about doing that might help them. And I do the same thing with the rest of the paper, which is their external resources, things they already know about or that they could add to their lives. And then one at a time, I have them pick one of the problems, and then start to see which things might help with them with those problems. And it, it gets the gears rolling. They don't feel helpless anymore. They don't feel overwhelmed anymore. I look for words like overwhelmed or when people say, it's just this or it's just that. They might use the word just four times in a sentence. And I think, OK, this is your spell, and this is how to break it. Uh, I also use a two-handed writing technique. I don't know where I got that from. It's been around for a long time. But it's sort of similar to focusing in its intent, except that it, fo it, it, pu it puts attention primarily on the compassionate, um, capable adult part, which needs to be further actualized in the wounded child part. And it allows for a dialogue between the adult part and the child part, so that the adult part learns how to recognize and then help the child part. Um, typically, I'll ask people when they're feeling that they're the, uh, the amount of upsetness they have is, is beyond the current circumstances or it's a recurrent thing. I'll ask them to imagine themselves walking in a familiar place and then they notice that somebody in the distance is coming towards them. And then I do a lot of visualization. And then as the, as the person comes more towards them and is maybe only 20 or 30 feet away, they realize it's a child and that it's them as a child. And then I ask them what the age of that child is and to start talking about what that child looks like. And, and what does that, does that child seem to be unhappy or worried? And I'm engaging the adult part first. And then I have them respond in writing as if they were an adult who had come upon a child like that. If they have children, I will say, you know, like maybe if it was your daughter or your niece or whoever it might be. And they write something, the child writes something back, and they write as an adult and they're with their dominant hand. And as a child, they write with their non-dominant hand. And so they're writing at the speed and acuity of a first or second grader and it slows things way down to the level of a child's feeling and then as an adult they respond in writing to what that child needs and eventually they often walk away with the adult either directly helping the child or being an advocate for what the child needs and it seems to take only about 15 minutes and maybe one side of a piece of paper for people to get to something they would never have gotten to if they were just talking. Okay, in the last part of my presentation, I'll be showing you examples of 
um, resilience and post-traumatic growth manifested in art. Um, start with myself. Um, just after my fiance died, I, I started a band with a couple friends and we're called Hello Menno. And last year re we released a CD called I Don't Wanna Say Goodbye. And we consider it kind of our transformation of loss because most of the material was written um, just after my fiance died. And also my band member, Teresa, um, her mother was dying of pancreatic cancer at the time. Um, this first song, I'm just gonna play a small clip of, it's called Oli Pop. And Teresa wrote this song and these are the lyrics and this is what she said about it. She said, truthfully, Oli Pop was written in my early recovery from drug addiction. It's a song that started as a farewell to drugs. Drugs were such a constant companion for me that I felt like I was grieving them being gone. Then it mutated and became more about my mother passing as that event came to pass and parts of the song got added. It was also the first song I wrote that had both music, melody, and lyrics. So it marked a turning point in my musicianship. I healed the belief that I can't play and sing at the same time. The images in my mind are about jumping on airplanes and getting as far away from the sorrow as possible. next song is called Leave Me Alone, which I wrote, and I consider it one of the saddest songs I ever wrote because um, there were some of the last words I said to my fiance on the day that he took his life. Uh, he suffered from pretty severe uh, paranoid delusions, and they were scaring me. So I locked myself in the bathroom and asked him to leave me alone. Oh, and I might note that on the day we went into the studio to record this, I put my vocal tracks down preparing myself because it was very emotional for me. And I left the studio and I came back and my band had turned it into more of a pop song with a more cheerful feel to it, which at first I didn't like, but then I thought it really marks a transformation. <laughs> two songs are written by my late fiance, Elliot Smith, and um, this first song, he told me that he wrote about uh, feelings of his painful childhood and about somebody who hurt him. And some people might argue that he's not resilient because he committed suicide, but I truly believe if he wasn't immersed in writing and composing and performing music most of his life, he wouldn't have lived as long as he did. And this next song um, is called Sick Man. And um, the first song was on his second album, and this one has not appeared on an album yet. But he wrote this much later in his life and career. But it shows that he's, it has similar feelings, it expresses. And he was dealing with these until he died.
And then the next uh, creative endeavor that's been instrumental in my own post-traumatic growth is working on a book that I'm writing called Thank You for the Days. And um, it's serving, it's gonna serve as a memorial of my time with my fiance. And it's a chance to have a voice and tell my story and to be heard. And along the way, I'm finding some inner resources and some healing and I'm exploring the meaning of what happened and reflecting on what I've learned and integrating and transforming. Scott Matz is a special ed teacher for developmentally disabled children. He also happens to be um, the drummer in Hello Menno, and he's a good friend. And this is a series of drawings. Um, he's also a prolific visual artist. And um, this is a series of drawings he's done recently called the Suspension Series. And he says, it started as form, and now it's become bigger. It's confusion about where I am in life, not really pulled in one direction or the other, just suspended. Hopefully when I'm done, I'll gain clarity. Aaron White is a, a friend of mine as well, and he's the son of Saul White, who was a famous abstract expressionist and a contemporary of de Kooning. And um, Aaron did this painting after his father died in 2003. Um, it's called One Set Free. And he says, the bird represents my father's soul. The character represents me missing my father and feeling the loss intensely. This one's called Wash the Story from Your Mind. He says, the character is looking at his hand with a story of something painful. It was a dream or an event that he wrote on his hand so he could get it out of his mind. Lost Hands is about not having total control over what happens to your children. Growth, he said he painted this when he was separating from his wife. So the central feeling was anger, but he tried to also focus on growth and compassion. And then Pull String Youth, he said, is stage three of recovery. It's better to laugh than cry, and it represents the absurdity of holding on to drama. Mel Cadell is a friend of mine and my neighbor, and when I told her about my presentation, she um, gave me this series of drawings to share. She said, the reason I picked these isn't because of the cliche symbolism of, of an angel, but these were the first images that popped into my head. My grandmother died after a long, great life a few years ago, and the last time I saw her, knowing she would die soon, is when I pictured this drawing you see here called Surrounded by Angels. Being in her presence in her last couple of months brought back difficult thoughts about a loss I experienced that was sudden and much more tragic. These aren't religious icons to me in these drawings. They describe the seed that people plant in each other and how we take on bits of one another. We carry each other around and even more so in death. Um, and this last artist, unfortunately her name got hidden, but her name is Helene Brandt, and she's from New York, and she came to my attention at the National Art Therapy Conference this year when art therapists were um, presenting films they were making, and one of the films was on Helene, and her story resonated so powerfully with mine that I, I had to get a hold of her and tell her about my presentation, and part of the reason um, it resonated with me was when I was in art school, I did giant metal sculptures like she does, and also, um, both her mother and her sister committed suicide. In fact, her mother committed suicide on the day Helene gave birth to her first child. Um, the first thing she said to me when, I, when she um, talked to me, she said what she learned from her art is the fact that you can't do it yourself and that it's a, an exchanging of ideas. This first piece called Olympia, she said, I wanted to show how the three dimensions are so fantastic. And as you can see from this slide, it opens up and it's figurative. She said the balance was very important, and, but it was very difficult to achieve. And the drawings that she's sharing with us um, were all done while she was in therapy. And this is a comic that she did called Daisies for Mommy, which is about her trying to give flowers to her mother, but her mother didn't want them. She said, by the time I was drawing the ninth square, I was really illuminated. It became so clear about what the pain was the feeling that sometimes mommy loves you and sometimes she doesn't. 
It's the pain of rejection. She says in her process that she closes her eyes and slowly an image will come. And I thought this next part that she said is very important. Um, she says she felt safe in knowing that her therapist would look at her drawings and not analyze them, but bear witness to them and ask her about them and discuss it with her. She said the images came so spontaneously that she believes this is really what her feelings were. This one's called Bicycle, and she says, in this one, I'm holding my mother, and her hand is inside my skin. This one's called Nightmares. I'm sitting on my mother's head, wanting something really bad, but she couldn't give it to me. Mother would verbalize her apology. I was angry at her, but there's still a feeling of warmth. These could be her nightmares or mine, but I think more hers. Um, Cradle is a part of a, a series of cage sculptures she did, like the first one, Olympia. She said this particular one called Cradle took her a year to make, and she had to lay down on the ground and have someone draw lines around her so she'd understand how to build it. Um, this whole cage series um, was, uh, represents her interest in the dichotomy between being caged and trapped and being protected, similar to being in a wheelchair where you're, you, you're confined to a wheelchair, but you need it to get it around. She said she had a lot of shame about her cage sculptures because people would react um, very um, strongly to them and not always positively until she said a New York critic uh, wrote about them positively and then she got over that shame. Um, this one's called Mother and Child and she said, it's of my mother and I and this piece scared me so much. She is offering me flowers but I was mad. After I finished the sculpture, I liked my mother more. The necks are made of springs, so they can nod at each other. And this is a close-up of the mother's head. It's made of roots and branches. Um, she says that I feel responsible for the sculpture's emotions. I feel empathy for them, but sometimes it takes me a long time. And this last one I'm sharing with you is called Masked Artichoke, and it's part of her latest series where she uses organic materials. And she says it's really changed the way she welds. And she said, art for me is a process of discovering something. I think people should approach art as if they were trying to discover something rather than trying to succeed. She tells her students to try to discover because everyone's so afraid of failing. And to help students engage in the process without fear of failure, in her workshops, the, one of the first things she'll have them do is um, clo close their eyes before they draw so they don't have to take responsibility for the, what they create. She says, the way I relate to my artwork is not like relating to me. It's like relating to something out there that I've discovered. And then to end my presentation today, I wanted to quote Patti Smith. She is an um, artist, a musician, and a poet. And while I was writing this pr presentation, I, I caught the documentary about her called Dream of Life on PBS. And after they showed the documentary, they interviewed her and asked her, um, why did you want to, the documentary was made over the course of the last 10 years from her age 50 to 60 and they asked her in the interview, um, why did you want to make this documentary? And she said, well, we started filming just after my husband and my brother died and I thought it was important for people to see the beautiful blossoming that can happen from the deepest of grief. Jennifer and I would like to thank you and thank the conference for having us. I hope that we provided some useful information. Um, we're going to be at the discussion this afternoon. We can make this presentation available. My contact information and Jennifer's are here. Um, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>